My name is Aaron Rosset. I'm from uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, I'm, I'm a statistician by training, uh, doing various things in, in uh, statistical genetics uh, uh, over the years. Uh, but I thought uh, we'd start off with something uh, that's uh, quite, quite a general uh, topic on methodology uh, that's widely applicable uh, uh, in genetics and biology, but also in many other fields. Uh, so, my talk is about how to sample if you must, uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and I really like this idea that uh, sometimes you must sample, so you need to figure out uh, the correct ways uh, uh, of doing it. So, uh, and that title, How to Sample If You Must, reminded me of something that's uh, only very vaguely related, but I thought it would be fun to start with. Uh, these are two uh, editions of the same book. The original one is actually from the 70s, uh, is uh, you see the, the one on the left is actually uh, the one from the 70s and it's called Inequalities for Stochastic Processes, How to Gamble if You Must. Uh, the second one is actually from 2014, the next edition of the same book. Uh, the two original authors were, were dead by then, but some of the more marketing savvy students uh, updated the book a bit, and then instead of being called inequalities for stochastic processes and how to gamble if you must in small, it was called how to gamble if you must in large print and then uh, inequalities for stochastic processes in small. Uh, and I think anyone who bought this book hoping to really learn how to gamble was very disappointed <laughs> unless they, uh, they have a PhD in probability. So, uh, so this is about how to gamble if you must, but ours is about how to sample if you must. So uh, I'm going to try to, uh, to give a very uh, wide perspective on this problem of wanting to sample uh, and the ways we can sample. Uh, so I'll, try for, I'll start from uh, thinking about it in a very general and abstract situation. And then we'll, we'll start seeing how many examples that we actually encounter in our work uh, follow this general sort of uh, principle or, or general thinking. So, uh, there's some very complicated distribution. It can be a, a probability distribution or a density of a continuous space, and we'll call that F. Okay? And if someone gives me a point X from the sample space, I can calculate F. That's, that's the setting we are assuming. And in fact, usually I cannot calculate F. Is that a... Uh, David, you said it works as a... a you said it works as a mouse? Yeah, but mine has stopped working for some reason. Give another chance. Okay, now I'm back. Okay. So, uh, what we are usually going to assume is not that I can calculate f, but that I can calculate this ratio. Can you see the mouse? No. It doesn't show on the screen. Okay. Uh, I just so uh, down there. Uh, I, I'm going to assume that I cannot calculate f, but I can evaluate. But given two points, I can evaluate the ratio of f between the two points. Okay. So given x and y, opa. Just made it back and lost it again. I can calculate this ratio f of x to f of y. And you'll see why this is very natural in many of our examples. And now with this f, there are some things. It's very important for me to do some things with, with this distribution, calculate some things over this distribution. So the thing I'm most likely to want to do is I have some function g. And I want to calculate the expected value of g over a, a distribution f, so uh, the expected value of g of x when x is drawn from this distribution f, okay? Or I may want to find some high probability point, so do something like find the maximum of this uh, uh, probability distribution. Or maybe I just want to do some random samples from f and look at them to understand what the world generated by f looks like, actually. What's a typical behavior in that f distribution? Okay? So this is a, a maybe a bit abstract. 
uh, but we can uh, make it uh, concrete immediately with probably the leading example and certainly the most important one in, in genetics and biology. So the idea of doing a Bayesian analysis, Bayesian calculations. So let's do a brief introduction to, uh, to Bayesian analysis. So uh, what, I, what I have is I have some complicated system. Uh, and the example that I'm going to be using for this slide, say I have a bunch of, uh, uh, what I, my data is a bunch maybe of few modern human genomes and Neanderthal genomes. But I'm interested in the system that generated these genomes. And this system is really the history of uh, the population history of the two species and the interactions between the two, the two species, right? Yeah. OK, I think I have a loud voice, but uh, because I, I prefer to look forward. Can, can you see my uh, mouse now? OK, so if I know that you see my mouse, I can look forward. OK, so, uh, so I have this complicated system that generated the uh, genomes that I'm seeing. And let's assume that I'm com comfortable describing this system with a bunch of parameters that describe the history of the two species. For example, how many populations there were within each species, how they increased and decreased in size, how they migrated, uh, how they genetically interacted, and so on. Uh, so I say, if you tell me how many populations there were, how big they were, how much they interacted, and so on, I actually know uh, the system and I can uh, infer things about the system. But of course, I don't know these parameters. Right? So what I do, I assume a prior, which is so, sort of uh, uh, some distribution uh, that I conjugate, I, uh, that, I, that I assume uh, uh, about these parameters. Uh, and if I know, uh, if I'm given the set of parameters and a bunch of data, I assume I can calculate this probability. So what does this mean? This means that if someone tells me how many populations there were, how they interacted, and so on. Uh, I can calculate the probability of the genomes I see in front of me. For example, if my parameters tell me that there was zero, inter zero genetic interaction between modern humans and Neanderthals, and I see genomes that are a, a, a admixture of a, a humans or mixture of a, uh, modern human uh, parts and Neanderthal parts, then the probability would probably be very low. Right, because the parameters does not allow the parameters do not allow what I see in my data. Right, so this is the notion of calculating the likelihood or the probability of the data given the parameters. Uh, but what I'm really interested in, in many cases, is learning about the process, learning about the parameters. So, for example, does my data tell me that for sure there was some time where there was a mixed population of uh, modern humans and Neanderthals? Or can I explain my data well without that assumption? Right? So these are questions about this, what we call the posterior distribution, which is the, again lost the, uh, this F, which I denote by F because it's going to play the role of F we had before. So this F is the posterior distribution. So that's uh, uh, the density or the probability of the parameter values theta given my observed data. And using Bayes' theorem, it just uh, translates to this uh, uh, formula on the right, right? Which is calculating, uh, calculating this uh, uh, basically joint over theta and x, uh, and then normalizing it uh, uh, with the integral over all possible parameters. So this is sort of the fundamental formula of Bayesian uh, uh, statistics. Uh, so under my assumptions, or, or not under my assumptions, uh, uh, given what we said that pi is something I assume, and this probability of x given theta is something I can calculate for a given value of theta, I can calculate the numerator, but I can't really do the uh, integral in the denominator, which requires me to uh, enumerate over all possible values of the parameter. OK, and what would I want to do with this? As I said, the most common thing I would want to do with this is infer things about the posterior probability. For example, uh, if my parameters uh, say uh, one of my parameters is uh, whether there was or a, a mixed 
population of humans and Neanderthals living together at some point in time, <laughs> then I could, uh, could ask what's the posterior probability that there was a mixed population. So G would be an indicator function, say, uh, one in configurations where there was a mixed population and uh, zero in configurations where there wasn't a mixed population. And this gives me the posterior probability. So I can just call it probability if I'm Bayesian, the, the probability that there was a mixed uh, populations of uh, uh, hum modern humans and Neanderthals. Uh, so I take, I take this f and I do an integral of g times f. Uh, uh, I, I do an integral of g times f and the denominator doesn't include theta so it comes out, right? So really what I'm doing is I'm doing an integral of g over that posterior distribution f. Okay, so uh, that's a very quick uh, introduction to what Bayesian statistics is about. Uh, and our point is that for every value of theta I actually decided pi theta. Uh, I, can, I assume I can calculate this uh, probability of the data given the parameters. Uh, but that integration, I don't really know how to do it. Right? I don't know what to do about the integration, and I don't know what to do about this denominator if I want to uh, calculate it. I have two integrals that I have to worry about. So one thing that would be really beneficial for me is if I could get a random sample from that distribution, f of theta given x. So what's a random sample of, from f of theta given x? That's a bunch of theta parameters, but they are, run, but they are sampled, a uh, bunch of theta vectors, that are sampled according to that posterior distribution. Right? And why is it very useful to get a random sample from a distribution when you want to calculate uh, uh, an expectation? Because once you have a random sample, you can replace uh, once you have a random sample, you can replace that integral with an average, right? And just for, uh, for each of my uh, samples, I know f. I can calculate f for each of my samples, even if maybe I can calculate it up, up to a scalar, but now it's not a concern because I have just n observations. So uh, uh, I can calculate f, and I, I, g is just a calculation, and I replace that uh, integral with an average. Okay, so that's an idea that comes up repeatedly in many places, that if I want to do uh, uh, an integral and I can sample, I just replace uh, uh, the integral with the average over a random sample. Okay, so that's basically uh, my very quick introduction to, uh, to Bayesian methods uh, in genetics and in general, uh, and a point that probably uh, most of you know is that uh, Bayesian methods uh, are extremely important and constantly gaining uh, importance in, in areas in biology and especially genetics. So in population genetics, uh, problems like the one I described are often uh, addressed with these Bayesian methods. Uh, in statistical genetics, there's, there's Bayesian versions of the uh, common me uh, methods in statistical genetics. I made here uh, a very partial list of uh, of well-known popular tools uh, in genetics that use uh, Bayesian methods. Okay, so uh, the goal of this was to convince you that that very generic problem that I, uh, that I presented to you, the population genetic example was just an example, but the problem is completely generic. I have a prior, I have some likelihood that I can calculate, uh, and I want to calculate uh, posterior expectations on functions that I'm interested in. The, that <coughs> many cases, the essence of my, of my scientific uh, problem is to calculate these expectations over the posteriors. Uh, so, uh, so that's, that's a, 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 and the, the important point I wanted to make is that being able to sample from that posterior is one way, maybe the most common way, to address this. Instead of uh, calculating expectations as integrals or infinite sums or whatever, I calculate them as averages over a random sample. But to do that, I still have to find a way to get a random sample from that posterior distribution. Okay? So definitely they are very important. 
But if I wanted to give you a detailed example with the uh, formulas and uh, explicit parameters and so on, I would start filling the board uh, with equations. Uh, and our question of interest, which is about the sampling, would get swallowed in all the details of the Bayesian methods. So that's why I actually don't want, uh, I don't, I don't want to devote all our uh, motivation to these, to these Bayesian methods. And the other thing are the priors, which uh, sometimes people argue about a lot. Where do you bring the, bri uh, the priors from? So what I want to do is I want to give you a couple of uh, kind of uh, cute, simple uh, examples from other domains completely. And they are going to show you the range of uh, situations where, interested in, where we are interested in this, in this sampling. Uh, they're also going to emphasize the fact that the problem of sampling is not tied to the problem of Bayesian analysis. Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian estimating posteriors is one place where we, are, we encounter sampling, but there are many other places uh, where we can uh, encounter interesting sampling problem. So the first one is going to be uh, this very intuitive thing that is, uh, uh, you could think of it as related to physics, or you could just think of it as, a, as sort of a cute problem. Uh, so I have a unit square, and I want to drop a bunch of circles in my square. Okay, each, they are all of the same radius, uh, and I'm going to limit it so, uh, that uh, the circles that I drop cannot overlap. Okay, and sometimes I'm also going to require that they uh, repel each other, so I'm going to make them as far away from each other as possible, or I'm just trying to, uh, in one version, I'm just trying to find the legal arrangement where they don't overlap, in the other one, I'm also uh, requiring that they are uh, relatively far away from each other by adding some kind of uh, repellent power between the uh, circles. And the question I want to ask is the solution that I get, is it organized uh, in a very uh, grid-like manner or, is it, or can it be messy? Uh, so here is a relatively messy uh, organization and this is one random draw from the problem of uh, putting, uh, I think, 15 uh, circles uh, of radius one tenth, okay, inside the one by one. So uh, uh, this is a 10 by 10, uh, uh, 10 by 10 square with uh, circles of radius one. So in my formulation, it's actually uh, radius point one in a one by one square. It's equivalent. And uh, if we think about the motivation, it's, it's uh, between liquids and solids. So the molecules in a liquid are, are messy and, uh, uh, and disorganized, and the molecules in, in, uh, in, a, uh, in a solid are packed together in a, in a nice, neat structure. Okay, so uh, we might want to ask ourselves about the typical solution. And what do we mean by typical? I've now set rules. The rules are, I, I have a square, I have a bunch of circles, they have to fall in the square and they cannot overlap, right? So I can ask myself, most of the arrangements that comply with these conditions, are most of them messy or are most of them very well organized? And depending on how many cir circles I have, how they repel each other and so on, the answer might vary, okay? Now, what about this F, okay, uh, given some Organize some bunch of uh, circles in a square. What's the F that would correspond to this? The probability distribution. So without the uh, repulsion, it's very easy. It's a legal organization if, if they don't overlap and it's illegal if they do overlap. So F would be some constant if they overlap and zero if they do not overlap and zero if they do overlap. And what would be the constant? So in fact, I don't know this constant, right? Because this constant is what percentage of all possible arrangements, uh, if I move se the centers freely in my space, what percentage of uh, arrangements would be legal? That's actually uh, uh, this C, or one over C. So uh, you see that I easily know F up to a scaling factor. It's much more difficult to know F exactly. But if I can use the fact that I know F up to a scaling factor, if that's enough to uh, allow me to sample, uh, I can, for example, uh, uh, look at many random samples, see what percentage of them are legal, and that's an estimate of 1 over C, right? That's an estimate of the percentage uh, that are legal. 
So here's just two examples. I haven't told you anything about how we sample yet, but assume that we have some uh, magic box that allows us to sample from the distribution. So that means give me a, a, a random sample, but it's not sampled random at, uh, at random uniformly. It's sampled at random according to the distribution. So a uh, higher probability arrangement or higher density arrangement are sampled with higher probability, right? So uh, I used my uh, magic sampler. On, on the left, I have a random sample from uh, this problem with no overlap only. On the right, I have a random sample when I added the repulsion. And we see, not surprisingly, that with the repulsion, they try to be as far away from each other as possible. They tend to form a very neat structure and look like a solid. And without repulsion, uh, uh, since there's, there's enough room for them to arrange themselves in different ways, uh, we do not get the structure. Okay, so uh, we can just look at these and say, oh, this looks like a liquid and this looks like a solid. And we can be more careful to say, let's sample many uh, uh, observations, many samples from this distribution on the left and the distribution of the right, and see that indeed most of the time on the left we get a messy organization and the liquid, and on the right we get a, a, a nice grid. Here's a, a, an even less or, or less or not very useful, but very cute uh, application, uh, decoding a cipher. So this is actually, uh, that, that uh, nonsense that you see here is actually some famous English text that I uh, encoded by doing a permutation of the ASCII uh, alphanumeric letters. Anybody see what it says? Okay, uh, uh, I see Itzik is already almost there. You have two minutes until I show the answer to come up with it. Uh, so it, uh, those three points at the end here, it actually keeps going. It's a bit longer than that, but, I, uh, but uh, you get the hang of it. So how can I put that into this framework? So I can say that I'll call X a permutation of the, uh, of the ASCII uh, uh, alphabet, alphanumeric uh, characters. Uh, and what would be F of X? F of X should be a function saying, how consistent is this with being an English text, right? And then if I, if I find solutions for which f is high, I probably find good permutations that are going to allow me to uh, decipher this text. Uh, so here's a, here's a way to do it. That's actually the way I did it, and, and we'll see the results. Uh, I took war and peace. So uh, in addition to being great literature, it's, it's a thick book with a lot of uh, words in it and a lot of letters in it. And very simple thing, I just did statistics on one and two letter combinations in the book and said, that's going to be my F, right? I'm going to use the empirical distribution from War and Peace as the distribution of the English language for the purpose of uh, deciphering this. Uh, and that's going to be my uh, language model. And then every time I have an X permutation, I would score it, I would calculate f by, uh, uh, by calculating some uh, likelihood using that uh, dictionary that I built, that English language model that I built. Uh, and so uh, why, is now, why is it now useful to get random draws from f of x? So that's the point where we have to make sure we understand what's a random draw from f. A random draw from a Bernoulli with 0.01 probability of uh, heads is not flipping a fair coin, right? That's flipping a coin that 99% of the time com comes up tails and 1% of the time comes up head. It's still a random sample, but from that distribution, not from the fair distribution. So my point is we have that distribution F. We don't know it, but for every permutation, we can calculate F with the model we built with the language model we built using War and Peace. Uh, and if I'm able to get a sample from F, that would be useful because a sample from F is likely to be a high probability permutation, right? And a high probability permutation is a permutation that, that fits the English language well. So hopefully my high, high, my high probability permutations are going to look more like English and are going to expose what the text is. Uh, so here I have uh, some random decodings. Uh, the first one I was uh, able to get, uh, Itzik, what does it say? Okay, uh, with the second one, I think we're going to have a bit more luck. Okay, and uh, here's the third one I got. 
uh, and uh, hopefully many in the audience uh, uh, know uh, uh, Anthony's uh, speech from uh, Shakespeare, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Uh, we see that it's far from perfect and obviously the rare characters in English are more difficult to, uh, uh, to place correctly because the different in, difference in F if I do uh, if I choose big I versus choosing uh, quotations uh, is relatively small. Notice that also uh, I space and quotation space are both very common in English. So actually also the two letter combination, it, it recognizes space correctly in these uh, two guesses, but it doesn't help it to, to understand that it's an I and not a, a quotation mark. Of course, if I use triplets or words or some more clever uh, language model, I would get better deciphering. But that's not the point. The point is that just by getting random samples from F, because F gives high probability to good decipherings, just by getting random samples from F, I'm already uh, uh, getting useful information. OK, so all I did so far was to try to convince you uh, that being able to sample uh, uh, is good and important. Uh, and if we can get a sample, we can approximate integrals by averages, uh, or uh, uh, we can see this kind of typical behavior of what samples from F look like. Uh, but, for example, in the, uh, uh, in the simplest example, say in the cipher example, I have no way to, I have no uh, uh, black box that can give me high probability decipherings. Right? I can get a random permutation, but a random permutation is not a sample from F. F puts high probability on good permutations and low probability on bad permutations. So uh, I need a way uh, to do this sampling uh, if we agree that sampling uh, is useful. One thing that uh, I hope many of you have heard about is this idea of importance sampling. So important sampling, the point is I cannot, re I cannot sample from F. But uh, maybe there are some other distribution, call it G, that I can sample from. Uh, and, uh, and then there are some uh, weighting rules uh, uh, to calculate weights that allow you to treat a sample from G as if it was from F. Uh, that's a very nice uh, uh, way of thinking about things, and I encourage you to learn more about it. it. It's likely to be useful only in the case that I can make G similar or very similar to F. And that often defeats the purpose of having an F that I don't know enough about to sample from. I need to make G similar to F so my important sampling would be good. I'm not going to be talking about important sampling uh, anymore, but I encourage you to uh, learn about it. What I am going to be talking about is Markov chains. Uh, and what's a Markov chain? A Markov chain uh, is a sequence of random variables such that the important property is that the ith variable is independent of all the previous variables conditional on the one previous, right? So if I know the previous value, I don't need to know anything about what came before it to know the distribution of my current value. Uh, and so it's natural to describe it through this conditional distribution of the ith element conditional on the i minus one element. Uh, and then very important notion that we have to keep in mind is the uh, stationary distribution. And a stationary distribution of a process like this is a distribution chart that if I have a draw from this distribution and I move one step ahead in my Markov chain, I still have a draw from this distribution. Okay? Uh, what's, a trivial, uh, uh, what's a trivial way to accomplish this uh, uh, requirement that the... Uh, uh, that they have the same uh, distribution. For example, if I make all, the, all my x's equal, nothing is preventing me from saying xt equal xt minus 1 equal xt minus 2 and so on, uh, then they all obviously have the same distribution. Right? But uh, we define uh, the stationary distribution of the chain to be such that if I draw from this distribution and then I move my chain ahead, I remain within this distribution. Uh, and the important, the, the really powerful thing is that uh, under some uh, mild conditions that we won't discuss, if a Markov chain has a stationary distribution F, 
then regardless of where I start, so regardless of what value of x I start from or how I draw x initially, I, I can, for example, take a random permutation and start from it. As long as I have a random ch a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is the f I want, uh, after I run the chain for a long time, then I get something that has the distribution f approximately if n is large enough. Yeah. Someone, I might No, uh, the sample itself is random, and then you can repeat it but many but times. It's not random if you repeat. Well, it was random in, to start it with. Was. It remains random. Oh. If I take a random sample x from f, and then uh, I call that x1, and x2 is equal x1, x3 is equal x2, they are all random, but they are all the same. There's no contradiction. If it's random. OK, it's so okay, okay, we can take it offline. Uh, the important thing is this, uh, is this idea. That if I have a Markov chain with the right stationary distribution and I run it for a long time, I get a sample from this distribution that I'm looking for. Okay? And that's really uh, 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 all we need to know at this point because what MCMC is saying, the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, is saying exactly that. I need to find the Markov chain with the right stationary distribution. Once I have that Markov chain, I'm going to run it for a long time. I'm going to start from some something, I don't care what, some random sample, some truly random sample, run the chain for a long time, and then I'm going to have a, something that's approximately, hopefully very accurately, a sample from the distribution I'm interested in. So we need to build a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is f. We need to run it for a large number of steps, and then we have a sample from f. And then we can repeat, run it again for a large sample of steps and get another sample from f and so on, right? So we can, as long as we have patience and big computers and we, are, we know how to design Markov chains, we can get as many samples as we want from our f, from our desired f. All right, so really all we need is an approach to build a chain or a good chain and we haven't really said what a good chain is, but at the level we're talking now, all we need is a way to build the chain and a lot of patience and we'll have a sample. So that's really what MCMC does. MCMC is about different ways of building chains that have the correct uh, uh, stationary distribution and then uh, uh, proving things and then arguing also for a long time about which method is better and why. Okay, so, uh, and we'll, we're going to be uh, touching just briefly uh, uh, on these things. So the thing I want to spend a little time on is the Metropolis MCMC algorithm, the most famous algorithm. And now we've added another component to our system, which is this function HUV. We call it the proposal distribution. And the way it's going to serve us is if we see the value V at time t minus one, we are going to use H to propose a, a new value U. So HUV is, uh, uh, is the probability that we propose u if we saw v, okay? And we're going to assume that it's the same as the probability of proposing v if we saw u. So that's just some uh, abstract function, and uh, I can, to, to make it less abstract, let's think about our cipher problem. So our, our objects that we are sampling are permutations of the alphanumeric uh, characters, so what's a way of, uh, and, and I have V, which is a current permutation. So how can I change it? For example, I can choose two elements at random and swap them, right? Two letters and swap their decipherings. So that's like an example of what H might be. Uh, and uh, there's a requirement that it's connected. That's a very mild requirement, meaning we can get from every point in our permutation space to uh, and any other point in permutation space in a finite number of steps of our, uh, of our switching function. And that's of course true of the example I gave for permutations. Uh, and now, uh, what do we do? Uh, what do we do in our Markov chain steps? When we see some value V, we apply H to get a proposal U. And then at the next step, either we uh, uh, accept the proposal and the value will be u, or we reject the proposal and the value will be v. Okay, so we start from v, we propose u, either we accept u 
or we reject you and stay at V. And the rule for uh, rejecting or staying is also very simple. If f of u over f of v is bigger than 1, meaning u is better than v according to f, right? That's what it means. u has higher probability than v according to f, then we accept. If the ratio is smaller than 1, then we, we denote this ratio by p and we flip a Bernoulli p coin. And so if it comes up heads, we uh, accept and change uh, from v to u. If it comes up tails, we reject and remain at v. And that's it. Okay, and the claim that I probably won't have time to prove, but I, I, I have the proof in here for it's a very simple proof, that this simple recipe guarantees that the stationary distribution of this Markov chain is going to be F, right? So our goal of building a Markov chain with the right stationary distribution, and look, we've used here our knowledge, our ability to calculate these ratios, right? That's all we need to know about F, being able to calculate this ratio, F of U to F of V. And in all our examples, we are able to do that. So with that thing, and for any H, we actually have a Markov chain with the right stationary distribution. So let's apply it to the cipher example. Uh, so as I said, what's a simple H U V that we can think of? Uh, the simplest one probably is choose two letters at random and flip them. Okay? And what's now F U over F V? Uh, so, okay, so I have it explicit here. A step of this algorithm is we propose two letters to switch. We do the switch and evaluate F. We evaluate F before the switch. We've already evaluated F before the switch. We evaluate F after the switch. Uh, if we've improved, then we accept the switch. And if not, we draw the Bernoulli and decide whether to switch or not. Yes, so for example, if our new uh, deciphering is better than the previous one, we accept it for sure. If it's a bit worse, we still have a high probability of accepting it, right? Because we don't want to be stuck. We want to look around the space. So if, it has, uh, if it's almost as good, then P is close to 1, and we still have a high probability of uh, accepting it and moving from V to U. If, uh, uh, if it's much worse, then P is much smaller than 1, P is close to 0, then we have a small probability of accepting the change and we are likely, so we are at the top of some hill, we have some good uh, deciphering, we want to go down the hill a little bit because maybe there's a bigger hill, right? We, the, the biggest problem is if we are on some hill, we want to be able to get to other hills which are maybe even bigger, uh, so that's why we need to be able to go down as well and not only up. So we run this for a long time and then we get an approximate sample from F. Okay, so this is uh, the Metropolis algorithm and, and the application to uh, five. Five is good. Uh, this is the Metropolis. I'm going to say a few words on, on uh, more uh, advanced versions of uh, uh, MCMC. Uh, one is Metropolis Hastings, uh, which is actually not a very important uh, difference. The point in Metropolis Hastings is that we up there, we do not uh, require HUV to be equal to HVU, so uh, moving in one direction is not the same as moving as in the other direction as we required before. And that might make sense because we may know some things about F that tell us good directions to move in and less good directions to move in. And then with Metropolis Hastings, we can use this knowledge. Uh, what, uh, what we do is we change uh, the rule. Uh, Okay. So, uh, near the bottom there, we change the rule from just looking at the ratio of Fu to Fv to looking at this ratio, the ratio of these products, F times H uh, uh, in the two directions, and then we still get the right stationary distribution. Uh, a more interesting thing is what's called Gibbs sampling, uh, and the idea with Gibbs sampling is if I have a way that Given a sample that's already from F, I can generate a new sample from F, then uh, I can use that to assure that I have the stationary distribution. Uh, and the simplest example is what I gave before. If I just keep it the same, then I, I'm still at F and I remain at F, but I've done nothing useful. So if I, if I have a way of changing it, but changing it in a way that the distribution remains F, then that's what a Gibbs sampling algorithm does. 
uh, and one common way to implement this is to change if x is a vector I change one co coordinate at a time if I know the conditional distribution of one coordinate given the other coordinates in f and that's uh, often something that I can do in all I don't have time to show it but in our examples uh, uh, we can actually uh, implement uh, uh, Gibbs sampling quite easily okay so I do have an example but I don't Okay, I'll go over it very quickly. Uh, so, for example, if I want to do Gibbs sampling for the circles in the square example, let's take the no repulsion case, which is easy. So, if I fix the location of n minus 1 of my circles, and I just, so that means there's a bunch of legal locations where I can put the nth, right? Wherever there's a free circle of uh, radius 1, I can put the nth ball. And I can easily uh, uh, calculate and evaluate the entire uh, space or the entire uh, uh, collection of points in space where there's an uh, area of at least uh, radius 1 free around it. And that would be all the places that, uh, 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 that, the, nth square, that the nth circle can go. Uh, and since my distribution is uniform over these legal arrangements, I can put it anywhere and it would be a legal draw. Uh, uh, from uh, from F, okay. So uh, that's uh, an example of uh, uh, how I can do Gibbs sampling, at least for this simple example. With repulsion, it's still possible, but gets more complicated. So Metropolis or Metropolis Hastings is much easier to design often than uh, than Gibbs because I can do anything I want basically. But Gibbs sampling typically can give much faster convergence and that's really what we care about because we want uh, uh, to get samples in reasonable uh, waiting time. Okay, so uh, I'm going to very quickly uh, go over. So basically all we said so far uh, is we need a Markov chain that has the right stationary distribution and then we're fine. Of course we're not fine because we need a Markov chain that moves quickly and gives us samples in, in, uh, 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 in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so a key question is how do I choose this h, the proposal function, right? Uh, so I want h to make big steps because when I'm on this hill, I want to be able to go down and up to a bigger hill to an even better uh, uh, deciphering. So I want it to, be, to do big steps to escape these local maxima in f. On the other hand, I want it to have high acceptance rate, so I want it to make moves many times, right? Not be stuck at one point and then constantly get rejected. Uh, so, uh, and these two demands are often contradictory. If I try to make big steps and I'm on a small hill, I try to make big steps, 99% of the time I'm going to fall right off the hill I'm sitting on and I'm going to be rejecting. So if I try to make big steps, I may end up not moving. If I just make tiny steps, I just move around the peak of the hill, I also can't get off the hill. So uh, that, uh, so that trade-off of making big steps and wanting high acceptance rate is the key uh, in designing H. Another question is how often to sample. So many of the methods we use for statistical inference assume not only that we have a sample from F, but with, that we have an IID sample from F, meaning assume independence between the different draws we get, right? So if I run my chain for a while, take a sample, run my chain another while, take another sample, these samples are not independent because they are part of the same sequence of random variables. The longer I wait, the more independent they become, but the longer the whole exercise takes. So uh, how often to sample uh, uh, is also a question. And really the best thing to do is often to take all the samples but deal appropriately with the fact that they are correlated. So not assume that they are uncorrelated but take this correlation into account for example in our inference. There's a lot to say about that that I obviously uh, don't have time to talk about. Uh, and another question that people are, are very concerned about is how long do I have, how many samples do I have to collect before I can stop and obviously if I have to wait uh, a week or two weeks or a month or six months, it's a big difference. Uh, so having diagnostics for that uh, is important. I don't have time, right, to prove the Metropolis algorithm. So a uh, very cute proof. Uh, I can show it to anyone who's interested. So to summarize, uh, so MCMC is just a conceptual framework 
for sampling for this complex distribution, saying you need a Markov chain with the right stationary distribution, and then you can use that uh, to sample. And I started from talking about uh, Bayesian computation, then I moved away from it, but still the most important application of this whole paradigm is for Bayesian computation, certainly uh, in biology and genetics. Uh, and, and, and the other point I, I try to make briefly is that obviously there's good MCMC methods and bad MCMC methods. Every method that has the right stationary distribution is an MCMC method, but the difference between good ones and bad ones can be huge in terms of our ability to actually get uh, uh, useful samples in reasonable time from them. Okay, thanks.